The first major winter storm of the season moves through the central U.S. and the remains of Hurricane Nicole, with extensive moisture, continues to surge north into the northeastern U.S. That's how it looked on the infrared imagery starting last night, and here's a look at the radar composite. You can see that vast precipitation field. It does look like there's a lot of clearing in between the elements, but that's a little bit deceptive. The precipitable water is quite high, which means we have high precipitation efficiency, and that means just about everybody is getting some rain. Here's a look at the surface analysis for this afternoon. The cold air is flowing south. Vast amounts of cold air advection coming down from Canada. And you can see the thickness lines right there. Those are crossing the isobars. And those form up into little boxes. And where we have the smallest boxes, that indicates the strongest cold air advection. So we're focusing on this area and maybe even a little further up north there in Minnesota. And that shows you exactly where the heaviest cold air advection has taken place. So the area as a total is somewhat about like that there. And on the other side, warm air advection, most of that is concentrated up in Canada in this other area right here. But there is some warm air advection taking place out in the warm sector. It's quite possible we could put a warm front right in this area here, dividing the 70s and 80s from the 50s and 60s up north. Some of that is due to rain cooling, but there may be enough of a boundary there to support overrunning and dynamic lift of the lower layers. Now, this map is a little bit outdated. I drew the center of Nicole out there around Bristol, Tennessee, but it's actually up there in West Virginia. Moved quite a bit in just two hours. And those are the current plots as we record this. You can definitely make out that spiraling of the wind field and also the low pressure center right there, 29.53, just south of Charleston, West Virginia. The National Hurricane Center went ahead and issued their last update on Nicole down to remnants, sustained winds 30 miles an hour, and moving northeast at 47 miles per hour. And the five-day outlook showing clear conditions in the Atlantic and Caribbean. So we could be done with hurricane season. Famous last words. And returning back to the chart, we've had a secondary wave develop out there in Texas, and that's produced some thunderstorm activity moving through Tyler, Austin, and coming up on Houston. Back behind it, temperatures in the 30s and 40s, and as you go north, we pick up some snow showers in the Dakotas. And they had those blizzard conditions out there yesterday. That's pushed up into Ontario, where they're getting some freezing rain and snow. Taking a look in the western U.S., we've got a plateau high setup. You can see the cool conditions out there, 30s, and in the valleys, teens. So there's been some strong radiational cooling working on that area. But lurking off the Pacific coast, another frontal system just west of Portland. Heading up north, we've dispersed most of that polar high. What we do have is right there in northern Manitoba, 1036 millibar high. That should be sliding to the southeast. And the bulk of the cold air is actually up in Baffin Island, where we've got this bullseye of thickness contours. You can see the temperatures out there at Dewar Lakes, Longstaff Bluff, down to minus 15 to minus 18 Fahrenheit. As you go west, we pick up warmer air. So that's definitely a change up there in the Northwest Territories. Teens and 20s showing up there. And Yukon also seeing a warm up just as well. And it looks like the barn door is open for warm air advection in southern Alaska. Right there, a southerly gradient and temperatures coming up near the freezing mark. And looking at the IVT plots, integrated vapor transport, we can see that an atmospheric river is flowing up into southern Alaska. 
This is this evening. And that comes onto the coast around Yakutat up towards Haines. Not very much moisture with that. And another surge heading into the southeastern Alaskan islands and further up the coast for tomorrow. Then going into Sunday, little low spins out there south of the Gulf of Alaska. That ties up a lot of the moisture and keeps the west coast clear. But as you can see, there's a couple other systems lined up out there in the West Pacific. And those mostly just merge into the other low and I guess there could be a bit of a Fujiwara effect going on within that cluster right there. But the main effect on the western U.S. ridging and very likely will settle into a positive P&A pattern as that southwesterly flow sets up over the Gulf of Alaska. And now we take a look at the upper air pattern, 300 millibars, using AWIPS, which is the same system used by National Weather Service offices. And what we see here is weak flow across the lower 48. The strong jet energy has moved up there into Labrador and heading out to sea. The next upstream system is way out there in the Aleutians and in between just a series of low wavelength troughs and ridges. So a little bit noisy there. Those are medium scale waves and that probably represents a long wave ridge. So that's it right there. And it's just divided into these smaller scale segments. So that's kind of what's going on there. And buried within that, a cutoff flow. And that's driving that system there on the west coast. Looks like another one out there towards Hawaii. So let's look at the forecast. Run that forward. And you can see things are progressing pretty well. Even though the pattern is a little bit blocky, things seem to be moving along. But the long wave pattern appears to be remaining in the same place. Yeah, that's, that's ridging right there. And there's a trough south of Alaska. And that's going to be a long wave trough across the U.S. So that's sort of a positive P&A type pattern. Not very well defined, but it is there. So we're looking at Tuesday next week. Let's go into the midweek and late week period, and we can see a river of northwesterly flow does start setting up. That's it right there. And typically when we see that in the cold season, that tends to kick cold air masses southeastward into the eastern half of the U.S. And another factor that I'm seeing here is a strong jet stream, which just appeared. Let's see where that came from. Yeah, that just kind of developed around the base of that trough. A little bit of increased energy there. And then moving forward into the 19th and 20th, northwesterly flow, mean long wave trough on the east coast, ridging on the west coast, and out in the Pacific looks like a east-west flow of strong winds are starting to get going. So this is kind of a split flow pattern, the northern branch up there like that, and then the southern branch kind of like that right there. So let's take a look at our dynamics, and everything starts with air masses. I know this chart is probably a little bit messy, but again, we're looking at some of the same graphics the Weather Service does, and these are slightly more technical. These aren't like dumbed-down graphics you'd find on other YouTube channels. These are actually used for forecasting, including 1,000 through 700 millibar thickness. Now, that's going to be correlated to the average temperature from the surface up to 10,000 feet. So that's a great way to sample these cold air masses. And let me just draw you out what, what we're seeing right now. The frontal boundary runs about like that, and it arcs northward as a... Uh, another segment of the cold front, and then we've got this warm front through Maine. And you can see how the thickness packing is north of these boundaries, and that's what we would expect because temperatures do not fall until the cold front passes. So the lowering of thicknesses are going to be found out back in this region. And you can see there's not very many lines out in the eastern U.S., 
So that's the situation we have this evening. There's another cold polar air mass about to work southward. That's high pressure, and that's driving the cold air. And you can see that the coldest air is up there in North Dakota. And if we want to go further north, we can actually get into the core of that Arctic air that's up there in Manitoba. So let's see how this works out when we roll the charts forward. Sea level pressure and thickness, this tells you so much about what's going on. The strongest cold air advection right there over Alabama and Tennessee for tomorrow morning. So it's going to be blustery and probably cloudy there. And we can see that the main low, the remnants of Nicole, heading up there into New England. And that'll drag the front through Virginia, Philadelphia, and down towards North Carolina. So going into the evening hours, things move along pretty nicely. High pressure noses into the central part of the U.S. And we can see return flow trying to get established out there on the high plains. And we take a look out west, all clear. Don't really see any bad storm systems out there. And we know that there's that blocking of that ridge off the coast. So what we're seeing here, this is mostly a lot of cold air coming south and then a little bit sliver of warm air advection on the high plains. So we're looking at Sunday morning, going into Monday and Tuesday. You're going to see some action going on down here off the Texas coast. little area of low pressure coming together. And we can see some waviness of the thickness field like that. That's indicative of a upstream wave, which could be approaching this area, producing height falls, pressure falls, and development of a storm system. So let's see that come together. There it is. You can see that there's frontogenesis out there in West Texas. Another low comes together. We're up to Monday night. Little frontal wave coming together pretty rapidly there. And that moves along the Gulf Coast rapidly towards Florida and into Georgia by Tuesday afternoon. Now, a lot of times these do tend to intensify and produce nor'easters along the East Coast. Doesn't seem to really be happening this time around. Pressures with that system are a little bit on the high side. So there probably will be some impacts, but it's not going to be too severe. And back behind it, another round of cold air advection sweeping down through the eastern half of the country. And there's what's driving it right there, 1047 millibar high. So we're in the midweek pattern going into Thursday, more cold air coming south. And here comes another surge of cold air. This one looks a little bit stronger. The leading edge, about like that. I think there's probably a warm front right in here, so this would be an occlusion. But that's some pretty stout cold air, 1052 millibar high, looking at Friday morning. And that's going to shove all the way down into Texas. So it looks like we're getting colder and colder here as we approach the Thanksgiving holidays. Tuning in to Big Rig Steve's channel. He's in St. Louis, Missouri, heading west. Now, typically I tune to his channel to find those beautiful views of the sky, but it looks like it's clear there once again, although there is a little bit of cirrus on the horizon. Let's see if we can find that on the satellite imagery. There it is, that band of clouds that we're seeing right there over the Ozarks. Plenty of clouds down there in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, with that frontal wave, and over St. Louis, northwesterly flow. You can see that cold air streaming southeastward, and some gusts up near 20 to 25 miles an hour. That's another look at the activity in Texas. You can definitely make out that frontal boundary right there. Probably a combination of the front and outflow from these convective clusters. And on the back side, that's where we have the cold air advection, stratus and stratocumulus back here, and then out cumulus bands indicating mid-level lift. 
in the northern plains, you can see all that snow on the ground. That's it right there. It's basically where the clouds do not appear to be moving. That's, that's all snow on the ground all the way up to Montana and underneath some of this cold air advection stratocumulus. That's located out here, flowing over Minnesota and Wisconsin and heading down into Illinois and Iowa. A very compact, powerful system west of Oregon. You don't have to be a forecaster to see that rotation. So the low and mid-level pressure center is going to be right there. On the west side with this open cell cumulus, that's going to be strong cold air advection. And on the other side, the warm conveyor belt right there. The warm front, I, I analyzed it as being up in this region. That's how it looks to me. The air out here is not particularly cold. And then the cold front, of course, that shows up a lot better. And that's going to be right there along that part of the cloud pattern. California looking pretty good. The cold front approaching Arcata and Fort Bragg. And out ahead of it, little veil of high clouds spreading over the state. Let's take a look at pivotal weather, the GFS forecast. That's going to be the front right there. And then running that forward. That grinds around on the west coast of Oregon. Doesn't really do very much. Some of the cold air in the mid-levels works eastward over the state. So it appears we'll get some of that mid-level troughing across northern California. But the impacts are going to be fairly weak. It will get this little area of low pressure going out here. And if we track that into the Rockies, you can see that coming together right out here. And that becomes our new system there on the Gulf Coast. So, yeah, you can see a lot going on just taking a look at some of these elements out west. So anyway, yeah, it looks like the potential for some snow there in Oklahoma all the way up towards Illinois. Indianapolis and maybe just north of Pittsburgh. That's going to be early in the week next week. And that's all I got for this evening. Already 17 minutes in and that's probably a good place to stop. I'm going to leave you with some footage of Tropical Storm Beta from September 22nd of 2020. Seems appropriate with Nicole wandering around out in the Appalachians. So gives you some of that same vibe there. I want to thank our new Patreon supporters who answered the call on Wednesday, Travis Munn and Andrew Krantz. Thank you very much for supporting the program. I really appreciate that. And thanks to our many other supporters, people like Keith Brandt, Patrice Brown, Ed Davies, Ryan Melberg, Paul Tukowski, Philip Slack, Thank you all for your support. Anyway, that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.